add one clarification to the CDC history, which CDC okay. is a huge play. <laughs> I wasn't actually the, the Deputy Associate Director for Science for all of CDC, but it was within one of the centers. Uh, HIV, at that time, it was HIV, STD, and TB prevention. They've added a couple more socially undesirable diseases to the center <laughs> since then. Um, it's an interesting collection of, of um, health challenges and issues that get pulled together in that center, all of them you know, being socially challenging. Hence, lots of opportunity for a social scientist um, and what one might think would be a primarily biomedical kind of realm. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is a bit of a retrospective in, in a lot of ways, and I've been doing that. Maybe there's something about doing something for 20 years. You, you start having that um, desire to look back. Um, and much of what I'm going to talk about today pulls from on an article that I recently published in the Journal, for the International, journal of the International AIDS Society which is a free online journal, so you can just go out there and, and um, look for the recently published special issue on social science and HIV. And in there, you'll see uh, an article that I have, which is a retrospective, uh, looking at 20 years experience at this interface with HIV biomedical trials for HIV prevention. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are in that article, and, but I'm also going to um, sort of open up that conversation even a little bit more than um, what I did in that particular um, reminiscence, whatever. So um, I do want to say that, you know, feel free to ask, stop and ask some questions if something isn't making sense, if you need clarification, if I'm assuming too much about what you might know about this topic, definitely, you know, let me know that I need to explain something. As with any health area, there are a lot of acronyms. I will try to avoid using them all the time, but I might slip up. So, you know, don't be afraid to ask me if something is up. So, um, here's an overview of what um, I want to discuss today. I want to talk about how we situate HIV prevention research and especially biomedical HIV prevention research. How, how many of you ha are in, um, uh, I, I don't know what the background would be in this, in this group. So, okay, biomedical. You're in some form of biomedical training or research, okay? Social sciences, all right. Public health. Okay, um, more on the behavioral as opposed to the social, you know, a little bit over here. <laughs> okay, so I, good, thank you. That gives me a little bit. How many of you are, um, have more than a passing familiarity with the HIV realm? You know, you've done some work in that, in that area. Okay, whether it's volunteer or um, academic or employment. Okay. So um, there's a wide range here, so obviously I have to explain everything and I'll do the best I can. <laughs> but when we talk about something like situating HIV prevention research, that, that's a social science term. We like to put things into context, and so when we talk about where is something situated, we mean what is going on around it, what, what kind of context does it sit in. I want to, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview about biomedical HIV prevention. What is it and, and why should you be excited about it? Um, I'm going to look at interlocking challenges related to doing that research and that interlock um, is why there's room for social science in this area of work. Um, how we frame the problems and challenges and what some of the implications of that are. And then um, what I'm labeling achieving moral outcomes. As you'll see, ethics is a big part of the conversation around biomedical HIV prevention. And if we're talking ethics, then why are we talking about it? Because we want to have an outcome that we feel is morally appropriate and, and one that we can feel good about. So actually using the M word um, is something we shouldn't be afraid to do in this context, although most people prefer to put the word ethics there rather than moral. And, and, and we could talk a little bit about that as well. Whoops. All right. I'll get used to this. So, we'll talk about situating HIV prevention research. First of all, the perspective that I'm coming from and is one of public health. And when we think about prevention, we really are thinking about a public health activity um, and framing it in a public health way more than we are thinking about clinical practice per se. 
So the way public health has been defined, um, a couple of ways um, that you'll typically see are first that it's what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions for health. All right, so it's a collective activity and it's proactive. It's supposed to be proactive in promoting health rather than simply reactive. Oh, there's a health problem. Um, somebody's sick. Now let's do something about it. So prevention is as much a part of that public health mentality as, as um, actually taking care of the outcomes of disease as well. Um, it's also been described as the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health outcomes. So not just the science, but actually the art of doing it. Um, I'm also going to talk about prevention. And so there's a whole kind of prevention science mentality as well that's important. Um, to understand. And when we talk about prevention science, we're looking at the search for generalizable knowledge that actually will contribute to this type of public health mission, if you will. So it's a little bit different from just a straight clinical approach, but it's, it's not contradictory to it either. But it's emphasizing kind of the social outcomes, population level outcomes, and social responsibility and the actions taken around there. Um, Okay, I will get this going in the right direction. An important part of situating HIV prevention research is to, of course, acknowledge that there is why there's a need to even talk about HIV prevention, and that's related to the fact that we really do have a major global epidemic. Um, these are the figures from 2008. This is the most recent map um, that I could find uh, on the UNAIDS website. And um, at that point, they were estimating 33.4 million people living with HIV. Okay, that, that's not the cumulative total of people who have ever been infected. Um, we are seeing trends that suggest that um, the disease, that infection rates are dropping and prevalence is dropping, and at least in parts of the world. So things may start to taper off, but it's slow and it's gradual. And we are a long, long way from saying that this epidemic is in a full decline and, and we've solved the problems. Um, we are seeing some encouraging trends. So, Kathy, I don't know if it, you know what the figures are today, but um, I, I don't have those memorized. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a major disease. And just in case you think it's a major disease only outside of the U.S., because our numbers, 1.4 million up there, look so much smaller than Sub-Saharan Africa's 22.4 million. Um, we need to, all right, I'm going to do this. Um, if, if we look at the U.S. statistics, this is what CDC is saying about our epidemic. Um, again, 2008 numbers. Um, it takes a while to, to catch up on the count. Um, and what we have is an estimated 1.2 million people living with HIV in this country alone. And that's a pretty hefty um, burden for our country, given all of our resources and, and, and what we have in the way of um, the ability to address health issues. Um, about 20% of those are, um, uh, are probably undiagnosed. These are estimates. Since they're undiagnosed, we don't, we don't know. They don't know they have infection. And we see about 50,000 new infections every year. So. Um, the numbers will keep accumulating. And we have disparities. The HIV epidemic currently is affecting the African American community much more heavily than it is the non African American communities, especially the white community. So, AIDS is not just a disease. That, that's an important part of that last statement about the fact that when we look globally, we see disparities with regard to the epidemic. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, a minister in Uganda, you know, where he said, what AIDS does is it reveals our broken relationships between individuals, communities, and nations. It exposes how we treat and support each other, and also where we are silent. And silence was a, a big problem for a long time and continues to be in some settings. So that's, that's kind of the context. Because of the context, of HIV because it, it's global, because it sits with a lot of disparities that are local and global and national. Um, we, when we work on issues related to HIV, we are always dealing with a wide range of stakeholders. And so one of the things that um, 
you know, came home to everybody very quickly in thinking about how to do <coughs> HIV prevention research, how to look for things that biomedically might be able to stop this epidemic, was the fact that it, people weren't just going to do clinical trials in a clinic, come up with a solution, and then roll it out. That, in fact, even just doing the research required bringing a lot of people to the table and working through a lot of issues together. So we talk about prevention research stakeholders all the time. People who are doing the clinical trials I'm going to talk about are very important, but they do their work embedded within the work of other people. That's another aspect of the public health approach that I think is just really important for thinking about um, when we talk about something like biomedical HIV prevention. So this is, this is a, a, a breakdown that um, I came up with working with Ward Cates and others at FHI 360 to think about who are all the different stakeholders that we find ourselves working with um, to, to try to address HIV prevention issues. And there's always community involved, and community is always hard to define, but think about the people amongst whom you live and work and who share your reality and your issues and perspectives with. And there are people who are the, the potential users of whatever interventions we come up with. They live in communities, but they may or may not be welcome in their communities. And so it's dealing with both of these groups um, is important. You can't just collapse everybody together. We have what we call civil society as a very important stakeholder in the work that we do. And civil society includes ministries of health. It includes our policymakers at national, global, regional levels. It includes advocates, the people who advocate for people who are living with AIDS or people who are at risk for HIV, um, or people whose lives are impacted by the epidemic in various ways. And then there are also the people who are providing care providing HIV prevention care, treatment care, whatever kind of care it is. And so when we, one of, when, when, we um, when, I first, when I was first introduced to the area of HIV, biomedical HIV prevention research, um, very quickly I started framing it you know, with a set of concentric circles, which is a typical social science way of talking about context that you know, we're not just going to do a clinical trial at a clinic. That clinic is going to be situated in a community. And because of the way HIV works in the world and the way it has emerged in the world, that community setting is going to be very important to the success or failure of what goes on inside the door of the clinic. And surrounding that, there are social, political, and economic contexts that are also going to be very important. So as much as, you know, People sometimes would like to just go inside that clinic, close the door, and do their work, very important work. What we have learned over and over again doing these kinds of trials is that we can't ignore the larger context. It will impinge on that clinical work. So we talk about prevention research stakeholders as a very important part of what we're doing. Let me do this right. Um, any questions or comments? That Okay, then what I'd like to do is, is explain what we mean by biomedical HIV prevention. And how, how many of, of you are familiar with all of the terminology that's up on this slide? Is there anybody who could? Just a couple of you, okay. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna quickly walk through what each of these are. We actually there have um, a variety of potential tools now for addressing the transmission of HIV from one person to another. But we have a lot of unanswered <clears throat> questions and a lot of research ongoing as well. Medical male circumcision. Um, how many of you are aware of the fact that there are clinical trials that have demonstrated that male circumcision reduces the potential for a man to acquire HIV? Okay, so over 50% effective, um, somewhere between uh, about 50 and 60 percent effective based on the trials that we've seen. So um, now it's controversial because circumcision, male circumcision, actually it's a cultural practice, not just a medical practice. And so there are you know a, a lot of discussions and issues around it. Um, and there are also people who are just very much opposed to male circumcision um, for other you know reasons, trying to minimize medical intervention 
um, which is viewed as unnecessary. But there is very good evidence that it reduces HIV, the likelihood of getting HIV for a man. Okay? Um, and then the, we also are looking at antiretrovirals for prevention. Now, you all know what an antiretroviral is. So it's, it's a medication that um, it is opposed to the virus in the body. It, it works in, in a lot. There are a lot of different kinds of antiretrovirals that work in different ways um, to stop the virus from having bad health effects. So this is a, antiretrovirals are miracle drugs. They're absolutely amazing drugs. They have changed the HIV epidemic to something that is now a manageable chronic disease for most people, as opposed to a killer disease. So looking at antiretrovirals for prevention, we've got several different strategies. One is something we call pre-exposure prophylaxis. That means that a person who does not have HIV uses an antiretroviral drug to stop the virus from getting into their body or from getting a foothold in their body if it actually does make it in in any way, shape, or manner. Okay. And there are different ways in which an antiretroviral can be used. We've looked at using the same oral drugs that people who have HIV are using to treat their HIV infection. And we have several trials that show that that works. We also have a few trials that are not showing that it's effective, and we're not sure why we are getting different results. So, but we have more evidence that it does work than we have evidence that it doesn't at this point. It's all kind of in balance right now. There are also antiretrovirals put into what we call microbicidal gels. And this would be a gel that a woman could insert into her vagina, or a man or a woman could insert into the rectum. And the antiretroviral inside that gel helps to prevent the virus from getting in and taking hold in the body. We have evidence of one gel used vaginally that has some effectiveness. And there are other, um, other there are still trials going on to confirm those results. Uh, we're also, people are, are doing um, very early research looking at things like vaginal rings, just like a contraceptive ring that could be inserted that would release an antiretroviral over the course of a month. And they're thinking about injections and all kinds of things. So it's actually a very exciting area of research using these very powerful drugs. Um, but boy, it is, it's really complicated. Okay. Um, we can also use the drugs, the antiretroviral drugs, if a person is exposed to HIV, then it, if they can take drugs relatively quickly after the um, presumed exposure to stop acquisition of HIV. We don't have clinical trials showing that effectiveness for reasons I won't get into, but we have good evidence that it does work. So it's post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, we have prevention of mother-to-child transmission women who take antiretrovirals when they're pregnant um, substantially decrease the likelihood of transmitting the virus to their babies. So again, more evidence. The antiretroviral is very powerful. And then we have something called treatment as prevention. This is a little bit trickier. Um, and these are clinical trial results that came out just recently where you have a person who has HIV and they have a partner who's uninfected one or more, and the person who has HIV takes antiretrovirals um, early, earlier than they would for health outcome reasons, okay? You know, like they're, they're healthy, they've got, um, you know, good CD4 counts, we can measure the amount of virus that they're producing in their blood, and, and it doesn't seem to be, you know, it's either not measurable <coughs> or there's very little. Um, and so antiret but if you give antiretrovirals to people when they're healthy, it reduces the um, amount of virus being produced in their body so dramatically that we almost eliminate the possibility of transmission to their partner. So it's not treating solely for the benefit of the person with HIV. It's treating in order to keep the virus under control in their body above and beyond what might be needed for their longevity so that they won't transmit the virus. So they want a virus to transmit. So treatment is prevention. Um, and that seems to work quite well, but we also don't have all of the data on 
you know, how, you know, should everybody just get tested and treated immediately, and what are the long-term implications of that? So again, it's a complicated area. Uh, there are, have also been research on other non-antiretroviral approaches that I won't go into because they didn't seem to work. Um, and most people have given up on those approaches, but not quite everybody. And then, you know, the, you know, the, the one that we really would like to see ultimately for prevention um, for people who are uninfected would be a vaccine. And there's lots of vaccine research going on. We have a flicker of hope that it, it's feasible and could work, but it's probably going to be a decade or more before we see anything. And it could be generations. Remember, we're 30 years into the epidemic. Um, and so, you know, saying that it will take another 10 years to solve this problem, you know, we've been saying it'll take another 10 years to get a vaccine for the whole 20 years that I've been doing this work. So it, it's really a wild guess on that one. But we're getting closer. Whoop. All right. So I talked a bit about the, um, the findings that we've, we've had in, in the last few years. Um, and these are estimates of the effectiveness for these different approaches from a variety of trials. And as I said, treatment for prevention seems to be, um, seems to have the best evidence right now. Um, looking at PrEP, you know, uh, we, you know, it looks pretty good in some populations, moderately so in others, but we also have trials that aren't on here where there was no effect shown. Um, microbicide that I talked about, it's, it's a moderate effect. And we don't know to what extent adherence to the drugs are an issue versus um, just limitations of using the drugs in this particular way. So a lot of unknowns. And that means, all right, I will get this figured out, <laughs> that we do have a lot of ongoing trials around the world. So this is an area of research that's not going away. We haven't, we haven't found all the solutions. Um, and it's a very active area of research. So there are, in fact, tens of thousands of people engaged in HIV prevention trials at any given time around the world. Um, a lot of research teams, a lot of protocols underway. This is as of October of this year, so this month. Um, all of the current um, locations where trials are underway. All right, down to advance. There are some fundamentals around how uh, biomedical HIV prevention trials get done, and they're pretty similar to what happens with almost any clinical trial. And I think this is important for understanding some of the ethical challenges that we face. Um, first of all, one thing that's a little bit different about biomedical HIV prevention is that it tends to be publicly funded or funded through foundations. It's, this is not going to be a big money maker for the pharmaceutical companies because the people who need <coughs> HIV prevention the most generally have the least amount of money to be able to afford it, okay? So nobody's anticipating that they're going to get super wealthy out of doing this research. So it's fallen into the public domain for the most part. The good thing about that is that it ends up being highly visible, and, and we can all see what's going on with these trials. Um, and, and that's a little different from what you might expect in a typical pharmaceutically-based research agenda where there are, there's a lot more protection around um, the trials and legal protection for that matter. Whereas when we do things in the public domain, actually, you know, the Freedom of Information Act means if you've got government funding, pretty much anybody's going to know what you're doing and can find out what, what you're up to. So transparency um, and it, it is a characteristic of this work. The funding, nonetheless, is highly competitive, just as it would be in any other endeavor. Um, and when you do clinical trials, there are certain benchmarks you just have to hit. And the cold, hard reality of those benchmarks are that you have to be able to recruit people and get them in relatively quickly. You can't, you know, the longer you take to get people recruited, the more expensive it's going to be. It's public money. Okay, it's foundation money. So you've got to find that balance between doing things efficiently and um, in, you know, in doing them well. You have to keep people enrolled. You know, people get tired of these trials. Sometimes people are enrolled for um, a year or two years or longer. 
So they're coming back to the clinic on a monthly or quarterly basis for a very, very long time doing a whole lot of procedures. You have to keep them enrolled. You have to induce them to be compliant with all the requirements of the clinical trial. I know that sounds like, you know, inducement's not a good word in, in ethics discussions, but that's really what you're doing. You're pleading, begging any way you can to please, please do this. So you are, in fact, trying to induce them to be compliant. And the funders are constantly telling the researchers to minimize costs. Minimize the costs, minimize the costs. So there is a tension there. All of that, and then we've situated in the midst of a lot of um, challenges. So let's talk a little bit about those challenges. First of all, as I mentioned before, we've got health disparities. Health disparities locally, globally, um, nationally, no matter what level you look at, you're going to find disparities. And a lot of the people who we want to bring into our clinical trials are going to come from vulnerable populations. Um, are going to be people who are vulnerable for a variety of reasons. Um, the way I tended to frame this is to describe it as a jagged divide between those who have and those who don't. When we come in as clinical trials researchers, we come in with what looks like a lot of money and resources. We have to hit a very high bar in order for the results from a clinical trial to be believed and to hit the regulatory requirements for any kind of biomedical intervention to get the approvals needed so you can roll it out. That costs a lot of money. It's very expensive, laboratory, clinical, um, documentation, the computers, all of it. So you come into settings where there may actually be very poor resources and you set things up to a very high standard. And so that jagged divide is visible in every way, shape, and manner when we do this kind of research. Um, we're doing it in the context in these disparities. And to give you an example of how those disparities work, um, often we're doing, it, we're doing this research with people who may not have very good access to healthcare normally. And globally, that may mean um, that you know, people are, um, I mean, that they normally wouldn't be able to get drugs that they need for, for even just basic health care. Um, women, if we're working with women who are pregnant and trying to figure out how to prevent transmission of HIV to their children, they may not come in for regular prenatal care. That may not be something that is normally an option for them. But if we want to do a clinical trial to figure out how to, how to actually prevent transmission in a a setting where resources are poor, we have to bring the women in to the clinical setting. As soon as you do bring people into the clinical setting, you may find that they have lots of health issues. Those health issues may have nothing to do with why they're in your clinical trial. What do you do about that? And if there's no good referral, there's, if, if you can't refer them to health care elsewhere, what do you do about it all? So. This actually has turned into, um, it became one of the biggest um, ethical challenges around doing HIV prevention trials. The fact that we identified people with lots of health needs, but didn't necessarily have anything we could do um, without changing healthcare structures. And so that became a major problem. So to show you an example of the kind of thinking they had to go into this, this is an example, uh, this is a table from a, um, uh, an international workshop that I attended um, with a, a bunch of bioethicists and clinical trialists. They were working on vaccines generally, but the, the meeting itself also had grown out of experiences of doing HIV vaccine trials. And some of the issues that had come up in that context were now being thought about in terms of malaria trials and other contexts as well in the developing world setting. Um, and so we were trying to figure out how can we frame what the issues are around healthcare that are challenging the work that we do. And this, became, this is the matrix that um, the folks at the meeting came up with. It's just a way of framing the problem. So you have what type of care might be needed? Well, there might be conditions, you know, the, the, the actual things against which the vaccine is supposed to be protective. So with HIV, you want a vaccine against HIV, 
You bring people in, you test them to see if they have HIV. If they don't, you can enroll them in your trial. But what do you do with the ones who you identify who do have HIV? Okay. So if there, if there is no treatment locally. And what do you do about people who become HIV infected because the vaccine you're working on doesn't work or they were in the placebo arm? Not because you infected them, but just because of the natural course of events. So there's the conditions. There are conditions that you detect as part of the trial design. Um, you, you might be testing for STIs or other, you know, sexually transmitted infections or other diseases. Um, just as part of your design, what do you do about that? Do you treat everything? What about the things you incidentally uncover? Cervical cancer, other kinds of issues that come up just through um, the standard clinical workups that are done in the setting. And then what about long-term access after the trial's over? So if you've got somebody on to care in the course of your trial because you decided you would provide it, what happens when your trial's over? So the short-term solution isn't always good. And then sorting out, well, what's the obligation? What's the agreement about how you meet obligation? What's the level of obligation? Do you treat? Do you refer? Do you ignore? And then what are the things you could do under some circumstances, and we would call those morally praiseworthy, but you, but you wouldn't necessarily shut down a trial because you couldn't do them. Whereas over here, under obligation, obligation means if you can't do this, don't do the trial. This is an ethical obligation. So filling in these boxes became a huge challenge for biomedical HIV prevention trials. Um, I'm just trying to do good. The other, another challenge, um, HIV and stigma. Um, stigma with HIV means that it's hard to get people to get into trials, that people who do join trials are assumed to represent um, all kinds of bad things in the world. And that's because of the stigma that exists around HIV. For those of you who aren't social scientists, this is the way a social scientist would think about something like stigma. Irving Goffman came up with um, a, a model of stigma back in the 60s, and he said there are basically three kinds of stigma. You've got um, stigma around physical deformity and disease including the sphere of contagion. You've got stigma around some behaviors. There are behaviors people can engage in and think about sexual behavior and HIV transmission and drug use and HIV transmission. And you get a lot of moralistic judgment around certain behaviors and there's stigma attached to people who engage in those behaviors. Think about homosexuality, not just here but globally. Um, and then there's also social stigma. You belong to a particular group. We don't like those people. And certain groups get stigmatized because of that kind of labeling. All right, we all know about that kind of stigmatization that goes on, um, and that results in discrimination. The thing about HIV is it hits all three of them. Okay, that's another reason that doing this type of research is so hard. You can't pull clinical trials out of a web that looks like that. Another challenge we have is distrust. Um, the distrust came up around a variety of issues. So there's a lot of distrust we know in this country around medical research and government involvement, but actually there's a lot of distrust globally as well. These issues come up and, um, it, you know, and unfortunately we do have historical examples we can point to of exploitative research. I'm not saying that that's the way most biomedical research gets done, but when it happens that way, it's just really bad for the field, okay? And, um, and it leads to a lot of concern that that kind of exploitation could get repeated. Um, one of the interesting things, if you look at some of the exploitative trials, so how many of you have heard of the Tuskegee syphilis study? Um, if you haven't, look it up, <laughs> because it's part of an important part of the history that you should know. Um, how many of you heard about the Guatemala study recently? There was a, the study that took place, what was it 20, 30 years ago? It was around the same time as the Tuskegee. Actually, I think it just predated Tuskegee, and it was actually one of the same people involved. And so that it, with Guatemala, what happened is we had U.S. researchers who, government researchers actually, who went to Guatemala, and they looked to actively infect people with syphilis in order to be able to understand um, was it the um, 
trying to understand more about the disease. And I can't remember if it was the course of its, pro its progress. Who, who had their hand up on? Do you remember the, it wasn't around treatment. It was around, yeah, it was. It was treatment? As well as maybe cognitive influence. I mean, cognitive that would be related to progression. Something. Yeah, I think there, there were a number of different little studies kind of rolled into it, I think, you know. Um, but anyway, it was clearly not good work. But, um, <laughs> uh, but what happens is when people kind of find themselves on the slippery slope to doing that kind of research, you start hearing some very similar arguments over and over again. And they're what I would call the no real harm arguments. Okay, and there are things like, well, you know what, these are people, they're not going to have access to care anyway, so anything I do is not going to make their situation worse. Okay, um, we'll give them some other benefits. In the Tuskegee syphilis um, research that was done, one of the benefits that was offered to participants was, when you die, we will pay for your burial, which is a very, this was a very poor rural community, black community um, in Alabama, and, you know, and that actually is a significant benefit. Um, so, and then others are, well, you know, the participants are going to die regardless of whether I do this research or not. And sometimes the justification is that this person is dying of a different disease, there's nothing we can do about it. What's the harm in, in infecting them with syphilis so we can understand a little bit about syphilis? It's a slippery slope of arguments. And uh, unfortunately, it's easy to start down that slope. And, and, but the point at which suddenly you're exploiting people, um, you know, suddenly the line becomes very clear um, when, at some point. So it's a dangerous place to be. The other thing is that because of this history and other histories, exploitation is often the default thing that people will look for. When you say you're doing research with vulnerable people, the first thing they're concerned about is exploitation, and people will look for it. They want to make sure it's not happening. So, Coming back to that issue of transparency around this kind of research, that becomes really important for understanding what your motivations are, what your explanations are for the approach that you're using in your research, and how you ensure that you're not exploiting people, but in fact that whatever's going on with the clinical trial, everybody understands what they're doing, why they're doing it, and they're making a free choice around it. Um, so, the distrust is a huge issue and, and historically has been a huge issue for doing um, HIV prevention research. Any questions, comments? The question? Yes. Uh, the, the matrix that you had, um, I think sometimes it's really hard to say that you can make all the, um, the obligations, right? I mean, it just seems to me that it's, for me, it's worth a comment. We, this, we come across this, like if we're doing a study on alcohol use and we um, identify mental health issues in that process. It's not really a part of what we do, but by, I mean, let's say the study's not about uh, psychiatric distress and people are highly psychiatrically distressed and there's absolutely no psychiatrist in the entire country. So, so what do you do, right? I mean, if you follow that matrix and we couldn't guarantee that we would provide some sort of treatment or referral for something that was identified by nature of our research, the truth is we tend, I think, to figure out how we'll handle it. Mm -hmm. But we don't necessarily say what you implied is if we can't be sure about this, we better not even do the trial, right? I mean, it's, I'm just thinking about what really happens where you get funded to do a project and you start it and you maybe didn't predict the things that would come. I mean, hopefully we would predict yeah. these things that would come. But just thinking, like, how, what kind of guidance, you know, what, what guides you or what should guide people when it may be quite difficult to even be certain of the ethical obligation in those four squares if you think about all the possibilities that could come from it? So that's, that's a great question because um, that's exactly where the debates came in in using that kind of framework because what, as soon as you put something under obligation, you're right then you are in this difficult position of if you can't do that, does that mean this research can't get done? And yet this research may be resolving a lot of other issues that are very important. And, and the way it, it ended up, um, the discussion went there is focused on are there particular things where yes, you know it's going to come up and you need to have a way of dealing with it. And that middle column 
The middle column was, um, you know, what was the best practice? So if you have an ethical obligation, then you have to translate that obligation into action. And that's where it gets resolved. So what would be an example of how you would meet that obligation? And if there is no referral, and your trial can't create a whole psychological support system for a person, then is there some minimal thing you can do, and what would that look like? Um, and the operationalizing that is where the difficulty actually does come in. In a, a lot of the other, other meetings that I participated in, um, you know, especially in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, around these issues, we would get people who would say it's a black and white issue. You have an obligation, you identify somebody who's HIV positive in your trial, you need to ensure that they have lifelong treatment for HIV because you identified that they have HIV or they became infected while in your trial, i.e. under your care. So kind of the biomedical clinical model if you will, even though you're there for three years to do a trial. And it was the heated debates around that issue that led to coming up with that matrix, which was a bit more complex, and saying, um, and, and trying to come up with other strategies for coming up with the resolution. So, yeah, I didn't mean to imply that all the answers were going to be black and white. Were, no, were, I don't think you did. I just was okay. thinking it was but, it's, but, but I could see where somebody could make that. And Kate, in these discussions that you've had, to what extent is it like very context specific? I mean, about what is sort of, what is standard of care in this setting, or what is locally appropriate, or what is, how is violence against women treated in this setting, or um, STIs or malnutrition, I mean, <laughs> right? Where malnutrition sort of impacts a majority of people in a poor rural community. Yeah. What do you do when you identify malnutrition there as opposed to identifying malnutrition in a setting where it's less common and the, stand, the standard might be different? So I'm going to move on a little bit because I think that I, I do pick up on a, on a bit of that. Uh, the last piece you, you brought up around nutrition, that really kind of takes it into this, this round, you know, where, where, you know, in my mind, that really is getting into the jagged divide. Um, and the, my short answer will be to say that out of, you know, the, um, the, the research centers that have grown up around the world, I think it's some, uh, some really powerful advocacy um, work that has also grown up out of those centers as well. And people trying to figure out how to find solutions. The problem is you, you may be able to help short term in a, at the local level with some small group of people, but the issues are really much bigger. So I want to move on. Maybe just kind of uh, that just sort of provokes something for me because sometimes those ethical obligations can also sort of be the same as good science, right? Like, I mean, you want to have make sure people have adequate food so that so that food scarcity is not a reason for non-adherence, or you want to treat STIs because that doesn't confound with your outcomes, or you know, so. That's, that is absolutely true. Sometimes, you know, doing good science means you end up doing good things for people, period. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't help us address the ethical challenge. It, it, it helps us to justify the item on the budget to yeah. the funder. <laughs> and I think that's the key. Um, and I would just, you know, so I, myself, I feel very cautious about saying that therefore good science is ethical. Um, it's like, mm, no, sometimes it's cost effective. <laughs> um, but the ethical challenges are still there. And it's great when we can get them, you know, to come together. Let, let me see if I can move the framing up a, a, a little bit more. So basically, I mean, here, here's kind of the, you know, my, my view of, of, of this particular world again. So in my mind, these challenges are all socially constructed. I'm a social scientist. I'm a little bit biased in that way. But when we talk about things like disparity, stigma, and distrust, they are socially constructed. All right? And um, at the same time, 
that although the challenges grow out of what are really you know these major social issues, um, they are framed within these clinical trials as bioethical challenges. And the way in which we've addressed them has been, in fact, through the classic bioethics principles. Have you all had bioethics, you know, ethics training, research ethics training? Is there anybody in the room who's not done a basic ethics training course? Okay, I'm assuming you're going to have to um, at some point. And when you do, you're going to learn about respect for persons, beneficence, and justice as the three basic principles for um, conducting any research with human beings, uh, and especially biomedical research, but pretty much any, any kind of research. So the other thing about these bioethics principles is that they're also focused on the individual as a participant. So we, we have the challenges that are people who live in particular contexts, they have things happening in their lives because of the context they live in, that creates a lot of our challenges, but then we try to frame them and address them as if they were individual level issues um, that could be addressed through a, a bioethics approach, which I always have found a little bit challenging, even though it's what I have spent a lot of the last 20 years doing myself. So in my mind, what the ethics framing, using a bioethics framing has done is that it, it tends to give us a, a lot of value around philosophical and logical argument. And that tends to be over and above, you know, what I would call, you know, um, more of a social science perspective on it, which would say we need to observe, we need to think about what the interventions would be, and we need to evaluate whether, in fact, we're accomplishing something um, that gets us to a better place. And so, you know, they are ethics challenges. We can talk about the moral rights and wrongs, but they're social issues as well. And figuring out how to do something about them is not simply finding an answer to how to help the clinician decide what's an obligation in that particular clinic for this particular trial in this particular community. You know, that, that the challenges actually are much bigger than the way we frame the solution, okay? And that's why I think that matrix becomes so challenging and difficult to fill out. Um, so the other thing, it, the other thing that happens, uh, um, a really unfortunate thing is that when everybody gets into the ethical debates, people forget that there are actually experts in ethics, people who are trained in argumentation around ethics issues and understand their complexity. I'm not one of them, okay? I am not a philosopher. Um, I know more than maybe a bunch of people, but I, I, there's a lot I don't know. And it makes me crazy to see people reduce the ethics debates to opinion pieces in various journals and newspapers. So this is an unfortunate outcome in my mind to framing everything as an ethics issue as well, is that then it also tends to get reduced to, well, what's your opinion about what's right and what's wrong? And then further, we get, we, we get issues around the contextual analysis. So um, because you know, the context where there are absolutely no resources and either you don't address a particular important health issue in this context for this group of people, or you do it knowing that there are going to be a bunch of things you're not going to be able to help them with, even though you identify them. You know, that's a, that's a tough decision to make. Um, a lot of times the, what we've seen is, is that the argument that, you know, it's okay for me to do this research here even though I can't address all of the problems because I'll, ad I'll address one of the problems and people here think it's important. Sometimes it gets reduced to a, well, you're saying that it's okay to do something here that you would consider to be unethical in your own country. So we have a higher standard in the U.S. than we have in poorer countries. And, and so then we get into what's called ethical relativism or cultural relativism. It's, you know, you, you can change your principles and your standards depending on where you are and what people think about it. Um, and that's an oversimplification of the debates as well. But we, we've struggled with that notion of, you know, what are the universal principles and how do we actually apply them in local realities? Um, what's required? What's our obligation? And where do we just do the best we possibly can 
And is it ethical to simply do the best you possibly can? It's, it's complicated stuff. You need experts for that. And, and they're called ethicists. Um, I, I was going to give an example here of gender dynamics and informed consent, but I'm going to move on because it's getting late. Um, but the part of, you know, where I, I, the reason I put the, the quotes up here um, is because this issue around the relativism, uh, this is a quote from Ruth Ashton around, um, around this issue of relativism. And, and she said, you know, it's one thing to provide an explanation of why an individual or a culture would hold certain beliefs or act in certain ways, and it's another thing to provide a justification for those beliefs and actions. Okay, so that's, that's clear. But what I would add to that is that it's yet another thing to try to figure out what the path is through those two. So we have universal principles of bioethics. We have really hard realities and situations and conditions um, and opposing viewpoints. And somehow we want to make a path between them and actually come to a moral outcome at the end of the day. And just saying that this is the right thing to do and whatever you people are doing over there is wrong is probably not going to get us on the path to solving the bigger issues that are creating the, the vision. So again, it's trying to, to think about where the, um, the social science perspective actually would be important. And so that then brings me to this issue of, of how do we achieve moral outcomes. Um, one of the great things that has happened as a result of all of the controversies that came out of trying to do biomedical HIV prevention trials is that we actually have people come to the table and talk together. So. Um, and there are, there are books that have been written and more books that could be written about the controversies that have grown up around these trials. There are nasty accusations and, and I, I mean I've had good friends of mine accused of being just, you know, really bad people, unethical and immoral because of the kind of research they did or decisions made in research. Um, and they're good people, okay. Um, and I've seen those debates carried out in very public settings. Um, I've, I've been in meetings where I've been screamed and yelled at and you know, watched other people being screamed and yelled at. Uh, but as painful as all of that has been, out of it, we've actually been able to come up with guidance that as advocates, as researchers, as funding agencies, we actually come up with guidance that we all feel pretty comfortable with. And we come up with spaces where we can meet and continue the conversation. There are now organizations like AVAC, the AIDS Vaccine Advocacy Coalition, um, which no longer does just vaccines. It's an advocacy group. And they and others will convene global conference calls with advocates all over the world whenever clinical trial results come out or whenever there's a controversy around a trial. They will convene on short notice a global conference call, hundreds of people all over the world, and everybody gets to hear the same story from the researchers and the funders involved. It's amazing. And this, I think, is so new in the bioethics realm. You know, we, the bioethicists, yes, they're important and they're at the table, but what we're doing is we're actually seeing new structures created and new ways of, of engaging around these issues that are really exciting and I think are going to ultimately change um, the way, you know, we talk about the ethics of research and how we address the ethical challenges. I think there's a need for a social analysis of a lot of this, and it's something that I would love to find the time to do myself, but I think you know, maybe there are some young people um, who are looking for interesting research topics, and this would be a really interesting one. I have the outcomes from our ethics debates. You know, there are certain outcomes that we want. We want more people having access to health care. We want people treated with respect. We want um, gender imbalances balanced out somehow. There are lots of things that we would like to see come out. Did they actually, were they the outcomes? Did we see the outcomes that we advocated for? Did we fall short? If so, how and why? So, so kind of, you know, how our good intentions actually play out when implemented in the field. Um, are there unforeseen or unintended consequences, both positive and negative, of some of the things that we've advocated for on principles? on ethical grounds. 
Um, and then I think also to take the issues that we've dealt with in the clinical trials and bump them up to this dialogue around um, the health inequities. What have we learned in the context of doing these trials that may help us to think about doing HIV prevention better as these biomedical interventions are proven effective and we begin, now we have to figure out how we would actually roll them out into the world. It's the same old world. It's got the same old injustices and inequities and the same old challenges that we confronted as researchers. There may be things that we have learned in the process of doing this research that really ought to be pulled into and become part of um, this conversation. Normally what we do is we see a break. We do the research over here, we get a result, we hand it over, you go and figure out now what to do. That, and that doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work as well. Um, and the other part to that being then that we need better feedback to the researchers as well in terms of framing the questions. Um, and then what I would like to see is, you know, that this, there's this um, area called public health ethics. It's, it's newer than bioethics. It's less well formed. There's more debate that goes on around it. A lot of the framing is around um, human rights issues, health and human rights. That's a hotly contested topic as well. And it just seems to me that what we've been labeling as bioethics issues in our clinical trials actually probably are much more in this realm that we're struggling with around health and human rights and public health more broadly. And so we should be bridging that conversation more effectively as well. Um, and that's just a quote about you know, that health is part of it all, human dignity, social standing, health communities, political justice, and the human rights issue. Um, this is where I'm going to, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. I told you I talk. <laughs> all right. This, um, there's something called a, a global health social technology framework that I just thought was really interesting because it starts saying it's not just the technology, the drugs and all that, but there's the social technology. How, you know, how the work gets done, whether it's research or the public health practice more broadly. And actually what we've done is we have created these social entities, these complex um, high-level entities that attempt to deal with all of these issues, like these global phone calls. Um, like advocacy groups, like um, you know, research organizations that are trying to make sure that the, the basic laboratory work gets done um, since nobody's going to get rich doing it. Um, and then back to where we were there. I think that's just where I'm going to stop. Um, actually, there was one more. That's the summing up. <laughs> So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs>regarding the ethics of the HIV vaccine trials, one thing I've been thinking about with that is that I'm not too familiar with the biomedical aspect of it, but you know, if you're getting a vaccine, you're getting an HIV antigen or some piece of the cell, so wouldn't anyone involved in a vaccine trial test positive, and isn't there a whole mess of ethical questions there um, regarding people getting tested, whether these tests are accurate? Yes. The short answer is is yes that you know the the vaccine would need um, the vaccines include some component it doesn't include the virus itself right we we've not gone that route um, but you know it's genetic engineering in essence so you know you get pieces compiled with others and what a lot of the vaccines will do is generate an antibody response if it does generate an antibody response then yes. Um, depending on the kind of test, HIV test you get, it could create a positive signal. And this is actually something that even for doing new HIV prevention trials, it's like, well, were you ever in a vaccine trial? Because if you were, then we have to think about, A, should we let you in this trial? And B, um, do, are we going to be able to tell if you're infected or not? Um, and how will, will we need special tests for you? This, for 20 years, this was one of the first issues raised back in the early 90s when HIV vaccines were first being investigated. And that was back when I was at CDC. And 
people were saying, so how are we going to deal with this with insurance companies and, and what are the guidelines going to be? To my knowledge, that's still the same conversation that was had years ago. Um, and I don't think we've got like, there's no like major policy around it, but what we do have are more and more and more refined HIV antibody testing strategies and a variety of testing strategies that actually can distinguish between a virus and an antibody. Um, so it's technologically less of a problem than it was 20 years ago, um, but it is an issue and something that people who go into those trials have to be told about and have to understand, and then they have to think about what kind of, um, what they need to do if they need to be tested for HIV down the line, or just to be tested down the line. Special arrangements are in order. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, if, an ethical challenge, but one of the information, more than anything, these things. Uh, I have a question about the treatment itself. Um, for HIV, the ARV drugs, are there any particular risks associated with it that are so severe that it's worth really um, looking into the non-ARV treatments? That's, that's a really important issue, and this is one that um, people are looking at with regard to the trials for prevention. Um, so you're thinking about the people who are uninfected. Is that what your question is, or the well, people who are infected? Like initially you mentioned the first drug, um, the medication has stopped the, like the... Pre-exposure? PREP, yeah. yeah. And also the, the one that you take right after you get it. Just the ARV approach to that. Okay. So for people who don't have HIV and, and you, we, you know, in the trials where they have been put on antiretrovirals, um, only a couple of different drugs have been tried in this way. And, you know, we're still doing um, we're still following people in order to be real clear about what the safety issues might be. And so, it, okay, it, it gets very complicated. The drugs that are selected for prevention in people who are uninfected are selected because they have a good profile in terms of side effects. So they tend to be ones where the kind of side effects people might experience would tend to be things like nausea, some nausea, some you know, maybe some diarrhea, maybe some headaches, things like that, and those tend to go away. So there tends to be an adjustment period. Um, but there are long-term effects that are unknown, you know, if, if people continue to take them. Some of the drugs look like they have some potential for affecting bone density, for example. So then you have to think about, are there populations where you wouldn't use that drug? And how high a risk would you need to be at in order to justify what might be a very small risk of an effect on bone density that may be completely reversible um, versus what the HIV exposure risk is. So there are lots of nuances like that that are, go into the design of the trials and the follow-up for people in them. For people who are infected with HIV, they already have the virus, and now you know it's a matter of keeping them healthy. Um, you know, we, we know that the antiretrovirals prolong their lives. They really are miracle drugs. So, you know, um, but, you know, a lot of them do have major side effects. They're not necessarily easy to take. So putting people onto antiretrovirals early is a balanced question, and there, and there will be follow-up to see whether if you put somebody on, as soon as you find out they're infected, whatever the virus is doing in their body at this point in time, what, you know, how does that affect their long-term health versus somebody where maybe you wait um, for certain indicators before you give them um, the antiretrovirals? So they're unanswered questions. They're, they're part of the research. Yeah, the, the studies you're talking about are efficacy, sort of clinical trials to test efficacy, so this kind of controlled clinical setting. As you move to effectiveness trials, are the um, are the ethical questions the same, and and how does it how does it differ? That um, I'm trying to figure out where to start with this one. Um, because people 
with something, um, with the antiretrovirals, because I think that's where you're asking the question around, are the, are, are the ones where there are drugs involved, not circumcision and all that. Yeah, um, right. So, so like the early treatment. The early treatment. treatment or um, So, so um, the effectiveness, I, I'd rather talk about the PrEP first, because that's the harder one. And what we have are, um, we have some indications of success and some indications where we have flat results. We don't know whether the flat results, meaning it doesn't look like it's working, it doesn't look like it's doing harm. Um, we don't know if those results are because people did not take the drug, they didn't adhere, they weren't compliant, or if it's because in a particular population there are things going on that make the drug ineffective, okay? So, we're in a really weird place right now where we've got some studies going forward where there are no placebo controls. And we're looking at new drugs and we're looking at how much adherence can we get with people. And then we have other studies that are going forward with placebo controls. But we're not yet at the point where we can say, this one definitively works for all populations and we're just gonna roll it out and now we're only gonna look at effectiveness. Um, and effectiveness for this would be people don't get infected with HIV, which is actually a fairly rare outcome and it's really hard to measure. We haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> so, and there are ethical issues. Right now the big issue is what do you tell people when you enroll them into a study where there's no placebo, you have some evidence that the drug is protective. But you also have some evidence that suggests it might not always be protective or might not be protective in some populations. And how do you explain that to somebody so that they make good decisions about their life? That's the ethical dilemma there. I haven't solved it. I think we should probably <laughs> stop, but you can stay a little bit longer. Chuck, can't you take yeah. other questions? Yeah, I'm okay. fine. All right. Thank you very much.